Good morning. <clears throat> the reading today will be taken from Luke, chapter 15, verses 25 through 32. It is the latter half of the parable of the lost son. It speaks of a lot of importance. If you ever thought about how does God feel about me, or how we should look and treat each other, I invite you to listen. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property and prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father says, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Good morning, church. It's quite a change to look out. I know uh, when I presided over the Lord's Supper, about a month or two ago, there was only nine other people in the building here. And last week when I did the sermon, there was 20-something people here. And now, of course, we've got close to 50 people. Next week, it sounds like we're going to have even more people. And so it's encouraging that, that things seem like they're, they're starting to trend back to normal. It's been so long where we've had to, to do things in an alternative way than what we're used to. But I think sometimes those, those challenges are, are welcome in our lives to, to give us the opportunity to, to overcome them. And so it's my pleasure to be up here again this morning, uh, providing the lesson, but also continuing the story that we started last week. And so, so basically, if you remember with the, uh, the story that we talked about last week, the son, it was the, pro sorry, it was the parable of the prodigal son from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. And so as a recap of what happened, essentially the son came to his father, asked for his share of the estate. So the father gave it to him and the son went off and it squandered it in wild living. And when he spent all the money and began to starve, he returned back to his father, repentant of what happened. And so I use the word father as an acronym to talk about the actions that the father took against his son. He gave his son forgiveness and affection. He tolerated the actions that his son took and made him, allowed him to make the decision. He had hope that his son would return. He educated his son in the way of the Lord and he rejoiced when his son returned back to him. And so we looked at those actions of the father to his son as a representation of the way that our father, God, as our heavenly father in heaven, acts towards us. And so the son who was lost was then found. And the story could have easily stopped at that point. However, Jesus continued the story with an epilogue of sorts. And so when the son returned and the father rejoiced and threw a massive celebration, everyone was not happy. And no, I'm not necessarily talking about the fattened calf, although I'm sure he wasn't necessarily thrilled about the situation either. But no, we, we learned that the father has another son, and it's that son whom we're going to focus on in the lesson today. So let's go back to, to what, uh, what Ray read and just kind of paraphrase what was going on. We know that the older son was out in the fields working, and he heard music and dancing, which of course was unusual. He wanted to know what was going on. So he approached one of the servants to, to ask him what's going on. There's nothing innocuous here. He wasn't there when his younger brother returned, and so he wanted to be caught up on, on what had happened so far. 
But when he heard what was going on, when he heard his younger brother was receiving a celebration, you can see that he became angry and he refused to go into the party. So he just went completely off the rails and began to yell at his father, basically saying that he is so much better than his younger brother. So why is it that the younger brother is getting this celebration where the, the older son isn't even getting a small celebration for what he's done for his father? And so I think that this situation that we see here is common for anyone that has a sibling, whether it's a younger sibling or an older sibling or perhaps both, that you've had an argument with your parents, that perhaps you feel like your brother or sister gets away with something that you yourself could never get away with. Perhaps you feel like they're favored for some reason, or perhaps you feel like they are getting a gift or some kind of reward that they haven't deserved or they haven't earned. And you find yourself shouting at your parents, why does he get everything? And I think that this is such a natural experience for us as human beings that when Jesus tells this story, we actually start to empathize with the older brother. We're like, yeah, he's totally justified. I've had, you know, my younger brother do that. He's gotten away with stuff. It's just not fair sometimes. And so I think that the reason Jesus is telling the story, of course, is to, to highlight the actions of the Pharisees. But I think he's telling this story as well because it represents a really big problem in today's society. And that is, is that as long as we are not doing what we consider to be big sins, sins that society as a whole would potentially condemn us for, it's okay if we continue on with the little sins that we do in our day-to-day -day lives. And so why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because the hardest people for Jesus to save are those that don't know they're lost in the first place. And so this morning, we're also honoring the graduates. You know, so I want to say some words to them as well. Congratulations on achieving this, this time in your life of, of graduation. You know, good luck for the future. It looks like some of you are going to college or university or looking you know, into the careers of your choice. You know, maybe some of those plans will change with the COVID-19 situation, kind of throwing a cloud over what's going to happen in the fall. But I want to use the story of the older brother here this morning as a cautionary tale but also as one of encouragement to you. And so as much as it's focused on the, the graduates, it's also a lesson that is applicable to all of us as Christians. And so I hope that everyone's listening to the words I have to say this morning as well. But the graduates in particular, graduation can be seen as a new beginning. And so it gives you an opportunity to make the decision of how Christ is going to play a part in your life. And so that in itself, I think, is is relevant to, to what we're talking about this morning. So when I was trying to, to come up with a, a way to, to summarize the, the points I wanted to talk about, I decided to, to use a word as an acronym, just like I did last week with Father. But I was trying to decide what word would be most relevant for the story here this morning. And so I thought, if the older brother were to continue what he was doing, his life of sin, and he was to go before God, then what would God do? And so if you look at Romans 14, 10 through 12, it says, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister, or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And so if the son were to, to be placed in front of God, he would be judged for his actions on earth. And so the word that I chose for this morning was judge. And the word judge, each of the letters in the word judge are representing some of the sins that the older son was, uh, did um, against his father. J stands for jealousy. U stands for, is it frozen? There we go. Ulterior motivations. D stands for disrespect. G stands for grading. And then E stands for entitlement. So let's talk about it. We'll start off with, with jealousy. So what does it mean to, to be jealous? Well, it means that you see something that somebody else has that you yourself do not have and you want it. And so it's easy to, to fall into this. We as Christians might be jealous of other Christians because we might feel they're receiving more blessings than we are. 
The graduates may be jealous of other people in their class that received higher marks than themselves or maybe became valedictorian or maybe got accepted into a university or a college or a specific program at those universities or colleges that you yourself were denied entry into. And so jealousy can be a big problem that most of us experience on a very regular basis. And so look again at what the older brother did. He became angry and he refused to go into the celebration. And the way he becomes angry suggests that this is probably not the first time that the, the older son was jealous of his younger brother. It seems to suggest that perhaps this has been an ongoing problem in their relationship. That Perhaps he feels that the younger son is the favorite one, that he's able to get away with so many things, that he's resentful towards his father for giving his brother his share of the estate, allowing him to leave and giving up all the responsibility that he has towards the family. And so I tell you that jealousy is a lot like a fire. And it starts off as just a small little spark, but if you don't control it, early on, what happens is that it can become a massive inferno that can consume you. And so you need to be careful of allowing it to take over your life. So what does the Bible say about jealousy? Well, in Galatians 5, 19 20, uh, through 21 says, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, Paul says to the church of Corinth, you are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? And so we learn that, that jealousy is really a sin of our worldly flesh. And so it's something that if we do not eliminate for ourselves, we will not be able to inherit the kingdom of God. We will not have that promise of eternal life. And so we have to think of those things ahead of us. Colossians 3.2 says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And so how can you overcome jealousy in your lives? Well, I suggest that rather than showing jealousy towards what other people have or what other people have done, show admiration towards their works. So it says in Philippians 4.8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. 1 Corinthians 10.24, No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And so if you show appreciation for the works of others, they are more likely to encourage you and to appreciate your work as well. And if there's a spark there, don't allow it to become a fire that consumes you, but allow it to be a motivation to you, to, to encourage you to, to go forward with what you want to do. You've seen that other people have achieved what they are wanting to achieve, meaning that if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. So let's move on to, to the next point. The next point is ulterior motivations. Forgive me, there's not a lot of you words out there. So what is it when I say to have an ulterior motive? Well, my son Nathaniel actually asked me this very question when I was putting my slides together. He read that, he's like, well, what does ulterior motive mean? And so I said, well, it means, for example, if you're cleaning your room and you tell me that you cleaned your room because you want the whole house to be clean. And then later in the afternoon, you ask if you can play video games. And I say, no, because, you know, it's a nice day outside. We have lots of plans. And you get mad and you say, but I cleaned my room. And so I can say, you know, you're not cleaning your room because you just want the house to be clean, but because you're hoping for some kind of a reward. You're hoping that I will allow you to play video games because of what you did for me. And so, in the same way, you can see what the, the son says to his father. He says, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And so does it sound like the son is actually enjoying the work that he is doing for his father? Well, I think because he says he's slaving away from his father, it obviously sounds like he does not enjoy the work that he is doing. And so... If you are doing something just for the sake of the reward, 
If you don't receive that reward, you're going to be incredibly angry or incredibly resentful. And so, in a similar fashion, why do you choose to have a relationship with God? Do you choose to have a relationship with God because of the promise of a crown or to walk on streets paved with gold? Is it because you hope to reconcile with your spouse or you hope to be blessed financially? If those are the only reason that you are in a relationship with God, then you're not in the relationship for the right reasons. You don't have the kind of relationship that God wants to have with you. And this reminds me, actually, of a television show that I really enjoyed. It just wrapped up its last season. It was called The Good Place. Hopefully some of you have seen it before. Um, but in the show, they deal with the afterlife. And essentially, there's two places. There's the good place and the bad place. And so everything you do on Earth that's good earns you points. And everything you do that's bad takes points away from you. And so then when you die, they tally up all your points. And the total of points you have actually ends up where you end up, in the good place or the bad place. And I think there's a lot of people on Earth today that think perhaps that that is how the afterlife works. However, if they find out, if any of the characters in the show find out that that's how the afterlife works before they die, like some of the characters in the show do, and they start to do more good just purely for the, the purpose of earning more points, they actually stop earning points entirely because their motivations are corrupt. You can't do good just for the sole purpose of earning yourself a reward because then you're not truly doing good for others just out of you know, the kindness of your heart or the, the want to see them be better. And so I think that was particularly you know, important uh, at this point. So how can you get around that? Well, you should have clear intentions and pure motivations. When you are talking to, to other people, whether it's your friends or your family members or your coworkers or you know, even people you just have a passing relationship with, you should really make sure that what you say is what you are going to do. That you, know, you wear your heart on your sleeve, your, your word is your bond. There's so many different sayings we have for it that basically know that people, when they see you say something or see you do something, it's for the right reasons. They can develop a relationship of trust with you because they know there's not something else going on in the background. And so in Titus 2, verses 7 through 8, it says, "...in everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us." So let's move on to the next one. The next one is disrespect. So the, the son shows disrespect to his father. Perhaps this is the first time he's shown this level, level of disrespect. In the past, perhaps he's done everything that his father has requested, somewhat resentfully, but because he wants to be the favorite son, he wants to, to be treated in a special way. But you see here again that, remember, he becomes angry and refuses to go into the party, and his father actually comes out and pleads with him, please, you know, come into, into the party. But I think it's important to note here that the celebration that the father is throwing for the younger son isn't necessarily just a celebration for the son, but rather the party is an extension of the joy that the father is feeling. And so for the son to, to not go into this party because he's mad at the younger brother He's not disrespecting his younger brother as much as he's disrespecting his father, and he's not allowing his father to feel the joy that he has in his son's return. Remember last week I said that in New Testament times, the, the position of father was a position of high honor in the family. And so for him to refuse to go into his father's celebration was a massive sign of disrespect to his father. And the attendees at the party would see that he was not there because he would have been expected to attend. And they would have known that there was strife and discord in the family. And so that in itself would dishonor the entire family. And so what kind of things does the Bible consider disrespectful? Well, in 2 Timothy 3.2, it says, People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, 
What does it say? It says, have nothing to do with such people. We want to be respected by others. We want to have the basic right to dignity when we are having conversations with other people. And we don't have to agree with what someone is necessarily saying or doing to still show them some level of respect. Remember, it's like what we call the golden rule in Luke 6.31, do to others as you, what you would have them do to you. You need to remember that if you want respect from other individuals, you need to show respect to them. That's the only way you can earn respect from other people. And so I encourage you to treat everyone with a level of respect. Graduates, in particular, you have been given the great gift of knowledge from your education. And people may approach you and ask you questions because they, they recognize that you have a high level of education on a particular topic. And so I ask you not to be disrespectful to others, to not make yourself feel superior to them because you know more than them on that particular topic. There are probably a multitude of things that they know far better than yourself. And so it's easy to say something like, well, you wouldn't understand anyway, but don't fall into that, that trap. Make sure that you talk to others, you, you share your knowledge, you share your skills with one another, because that is the best way for you to become more well-rounded, better individuals. So let's move on to, to the next point. The next one is grading. So grading may not be as obvious, particularly from the name alone, but I think it's probably the, the key point of this entire story. And I've mentioned it already a little bit at the beginning. But look again at what the son is doing here. So he says he's been slaving away for his, uh, his father, never disobeyed his orders. But the son, younger son returns and he has squandered his property with prostitutes and he comes home and you're throwing a big celebration. And so again, you can see that the older brother is comparing his level of sin to the sin of the younger brother. He's saying that the sin that the younger brother has done is unforgivable. And so, he sees sin as a scale, for example, from 1 to 10, rather than simply as a yes or a no. And so we may consider things like murder, you know, to be a big sin, and you know, that's a full 10 out of 10 on the scale. But then perhaps stealing a car is only an 8 on the scale. But stealing candy, you know, we'll give that a 4. You know, that's not, and that's not a big deal. But then maybe some of the things I talked about this morning, jealousy, um, disrespect, those things maybe we consider little sins that those are only maybe a one or two on the scale, and they're not really hurting anyone. And the problem is, is if you judge your level of sin compared to other people, you are always going to lose. You are not going to recognize that you yourself are a sinner and that you need to improve. And the problem is, is that the little sins are the most dangerous. The, the big sins are obvious to us. We know that we're not supposed to do some of those big sins. In a lot of cases, there are laws against some of those sins. But the little sins are easy to dismiss in our own minds. And when we start to dismiss them, that's when it becomes a challenge for us. And, you know, looking at the title of the sermon that I have, I entitled my sermon, Good Enough. Do you feel sometimes that what you're doing as a Christian is good enough? Do you feel like there's no need to, to improve yourself because what you're doing is good enough. The thing is, is that God holds all sin equally detestable. However, he sent his son to die on the cross so that we have forgiveness for all sins equally. So it doesn't matter what level of sin you're doing, the act of forgiveness is available for all as well. Romans 5, 7 through 8 says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so you may actually take the title of my sermon another way. You may think that maybe you're not good enough, that perhaps you've done something so bad that you just, you're beyond forgiveness. You're a bad person. But I'll take another line from the TV show I mentioned earlier, The Good Place, where one of the characters says, it doesn't matter if they are a good person or a bad person. What matters is that they're better today than they were yesterday. 
And that really struck a chord when I heard it because I thought that's such you know, a great statement because so much of the time people see themselves as a bad person or a good person and they don't want to change because there seems like such a gap between those two positions. And the thing is, is that it is possible to change, to move forward, to better yourself if you do it one small step at a time. As long as each day you are better than you were the day before, you will get there. You continue to move forward without falling back into your own old habits. And so that brings me to, to the last point, which was entitlement. So entitlement means you think you have a right to something or you deserve special privileges that you haven't earned from anything that you've done. And so the, the son says to his father, all these years I've been slaving for you, yet you never even gave me a young goat. So again, he thinks he deserves this reward simply for, for being the son and, and working for his father. And you see that entitlement ties in a lot to, to the ulterior motives that I talked about already. Again, expecting that there's a reward even when you haven't necessarily earned it. And so it's easy to fall into a trap of being entitled. I mean, again, for the new graduates, you may feel that you're entitled to, to the job of your dreams right out of graduation. You think, you're going to find something that's high paying, the hours I want, the vacation time. But the reality is, is that for most of you, you haven't earned that position yet. And there's going to be a lot of years that you go through where you work hard to earn the right to have that particular job. And if you work hard enough, I'm sure, you know, you will get there eventually. And we as Christians can also be guilty of feeling entitled as well. Have you ever felt to yourself, you know, I am going to end up in heaven for sure. You know, I deserve it. I come to church every single week. I do everything I'm supposed to do. I attend Bible studies. I'm not breaking any of the big rules. But the thing is, is that none of us deserve to get into heaven. None of us have earned that right because we are all still sinners. And as it says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But even though we are not entitled to get into heaven, God does set a path for us. He gives us a path by giving something to us. Everyone's familiar with John 3.16, where, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So he gave something to us so that we do have a pathway forward. And that is something that we need to always remember. And so in that same vein, I say to you, rather than feeling like the world owes you something, I challenge you to give back to the world. Help those that are less fortunate. Use your, your natural skills or use the, the knowledge that you've gained through your education to help others around you. Use them to advance God's plan. Use them in God's service going forward. And do it cheerfully. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Luke 6.35 says, But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you'll be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. So let's summarize the points that we've talked about this morning. We showed that the, the older son had jealousy towards his younger brother for the celebration that the father was throwing. We saw that the older son had ulterior motivations, that he wasn't working for his father for the reasons that he had previously said. He was disrespectful to his father by not going into the celebration that his father was showing. He graded his sin against his younger brother, saying that he was much better than his sin and he didn't need to make a change. And then finally, he felt entitled to the reward that he had not earned. And so how did we talk about combating each of these different things? Well, instead of feeling jealous, we talked about showing admiration towards other people. Instead of having ulterior motivations, we talked about having clear intentions. Instead of showing disrespect, we said to show respect to other people. 
Instead of grading yourself against other people, consider all sin to be equal and that everyone has the same need to change. And then finally, instead of feeling entitled to um, something that maybe you haven't earned, I challenge you to give back to the world so that other people can receive things that perhaps they haven't earned or received. And these things I've listed on the right are not things will necessarily earn your entry into heaven, but by doing these things, you are doing something to other people around us that God does to us all the time. You rearrange things. He's offering us grace. And so he gives us that opportunity, that entry into heaven, because we haven't deserved it. We haven't earned the right, but it's still something that he gives to us. In Titus 2, 11 through 12, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And we haven't even talked about how the Father responds back to the Son after he says all of these things. He says to his son, my son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. And I like this picture because it represents how God wants to raise us up. He wants to hold us up on high, give us the opportunity to to reach our full potential. But all we need to do is again go to him and ask. There are many things that the older brother was upset about that if he had only talked to his father, if he had expressed these earlier, if he had asked for the things that he wanted, his father would have more than likely given them to him. But rather than that, he kept it to himself. He kept himself, you know, resentful and angry at his father and at his brother. And so, like, as I said last week, God will give you everything that you need as long as you approach him with the right attitude. And so... I've asked Chad to to lead us with a closing song today that I thought was particularly relevant to this um, lesson that I put together because it talks about the one that went to the cross, that through God's grace died so that we would have our sins taken from us, that we would have that path for eternal life. It reminds us of where we need to place our faith And that is in Christ alone. And so as we sing that that song here, in Christ alone, think of the words that we're singing. When we sing, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Think about that. He is our hope. He is the light and the strength for us. We sing praises in his most holy name. We want him to be part of our lives. He is our rock, our cornerstone. He is always there for us. And I do want to say one last thing to to the graduates before I close. And that's just, again, congratulations to you guys. You know, this is such a, a great achievement. And God bless you in all of the things that you are doing, all of your future endeavors, both big and small. And I leave you with this, and I ask you to do one thing. And that is in a world where you can be anything, Be kind. God bless.